All the Young Dudes, Sirius's Perspective by Roller Coaster Words. Chapter 55, Third Year, Lions, Owls and Wolves. Friday, the 28th of June, 1974. You should be ashamed of yourself, James said, shaking his head. I mean, really, Black, have you no decency, no humility? I don't think I saw you open a textbook even once. The results of their finals had been posted. Sirius yawned. Natural genius, Potter, he drawled, brushing his hair out of his eyes. I can't help it. Feel free to bask in my glory, though. James leaned dramatically onto Remus's shoulder, groaning. It's up to you, Mooney. You're the only one who can keep his ego in check. Remus had come first in History of Magic, narrowly beating Sirius. But Sirius had beat him in arithmancy. He shook off James, laughing. He looked half embarrassed and half pleased by the attention. After three years of undeniably excellent marks, Remus seemed to have accepted the fact of his own academic ability, no longer looking as though he wanted to crawl under a rock any time someone called him smart. In fact... At breakfast the next morning, when his care of magical creatures professor came over to congratulate Lupin on coming top in the class, Mooney practically beamed with happiness. Teacher's pet, Sirius teased as the tall, long-haired professor walked away. Remus ignored him, smiling down at his porridge and looking incredibly pleased with himself. Can't believe that's it till fourth year now, James remarked, using his robes to clean off his glasses. Sirius's mood immediately fell. Do you have to keep reminding me? He moaned, petulant. Plenty to do over the summer, James replied. It'll fly by. Unfortunately, Remus was listening again. What are you doing over the summer? He asked, narrowing his eyes suspiciously. James blinked. Planning pranks, obviously, Sirius jumped in quickly. Got to keep ahead of the curve, Remu, my boy. We have a reputation to maintain. Remus studied him for a moment, and then shrugged seeming to accept this explanation. Sirius released a breath, catching James's eye and giving him a meaningful look. The marauders, sans Mooney, had agreed that they would begin their Animagus project over summer, communicating via letters to coordinate their efforts. Of course, with Sirius separated from the others, they might run into some problems, but the first steps were safe enough, even if they made mistakes. And Sirius had convinced Peter and James that they should at least try to start, after breakfast, they returned to their room, where James, Peter and Remus began to pack, and Sirius began doing absolutely anything he could think of that did not involve packing. He rifled through his trunk, flipped through James's Quidditch magazines, and flicked his record player on and off, refusing to acknowledge that in less than 24 hours he would be leaving the Hogwarts behind. It's getting done whether you like it or not, James said, placing his hands on his hips in a gesture reminiscent of Mrs Potter. You'll do it for me, like last year, Sirius replied dismissively. He was trying to see how many pull-ups he could do on the bed frame before something gave out, either his arms or the ancient creaking wood. In the corner, Remus closed the lid of his trunk with a decisive clink. His normally chaotic space, which was always cluttered with quills, parchment and books, was stripped bare, looking distinctly unmoony. Sirius didn't like it. He watched out of the corner of his eye as Remus wandered over to flip through his records. On the other side of the room, James was casting meaningful looks his way. They had all expected Lupin to head to the hospital wing the moment he finished packing, and they were counting on that distraction to buy them some time to discuss their anime guy plans. Mooney, James said carefully, don't you have to go and see Madame Pomfrey? Uh, yeah, but not right now. Remus looked up, brow furrowed. Well, I mean, if you finish packing, you may as well, right? When I've done Sirius's stuff, I was going to suggest we all go down for a fly on our brooms. And you hate flying, so... Oh, really? Okay, then. Remus nodded curtly, looking a bit put out. Sirius cringed at James's clumsy attempts at subtlety, but comforted himself with the knowledge that it was all, at the end of the day, for Remus's sake. We'll see you at dinner, right, Mooney? Sirius asked, trying to prevent him from getting the impression that they didn't want him around. Well... He supposed they didn't, but just temporarily, and only because Lupin was too stubborn to let them help him without making a fuss. 
Uh, yeah, I suppose. Remus mumbled. He left the room without saying a proper goodbye. Sirius sighed as the door shut behind him. Nice going, Potter. He punched James on the arm before collapsing back onto his bed. Oi, someone had to say something. You're the one insisting that we start everything this summer. It's not like we could talk about it with Mooney here. Yeah, yeah, Sirius waved a hand. He lay quietly for a moment, staring up at the wooden bed frame overhead. To one side, he could hear the sound of James opening his trunk and beginning to shove his things inside. Sirius sighed and sat up. Well then, he clapped his hands together. Let's discuss, shall we? Ingredients. Ingredients, James nodded, moving an armful of Sirius's muggle books over to his own trunk for safekeeping during the summer. Manjake leaves won't be an issue, Sirius said, pulling a list from his pocket. Pete, you already nicked some from the greenhouse, yeah? Peter nodded vigorously. They're in my trunk somewhere, let me just... He began digging, pulling out the clothes and books that he'd just finished packing and making a mess all over again. Sirius grinned. Brilliant. Then all we need is the crystal phyllis that can receive the pure rays of the moon. And they'll have to be big enough to hold all of the ingredients too, remember. James, have you got anything like that at your house? James, have you got anything like that at your house? Maybe. I'll check. I think Mum's got some old potion brewing kits and cabinets somewhere. Sirius nodded. All right, I'll check too. If none of us have anything that works, we'll just have to buy some at Diagon Alley. Shouldn't be too hard to find. Let's see. Silver teaspoons. I've got that one covered. My family's got far more silver than we could ever possibly use. Suppose Creature might notice if one goes missing, but he'll hardly be able to prove it was me, so long as I hide it well enough. James scratched his chin, thoughtfully. Pretty sure we've got some silver spoons too. If you want, I can handle that part, since my parents probably wouldn't mind. I mean, not that I'd tell them, but if they were to find out, I don't think... Um, he trailed off, glancing at Peter awkwardly. Sirius stiffened. It's all right, Potter, I can do it he said with forced nonchalance. James exchanged another glance with Peter, which he pretended not to notice. Well, I'll still check too, all the same. If you like. Other than that, it's just down to the Death Head's Hawk Moth Chrysalis. I think Mum bought some of those once, Peter chirped up. From some sort of special potions ingredients store. They're really expensive. He seemed to realise who he was talking to immediately after speaking and bit his lip, looking embarrassed. No worries, Pete, James said warmly. Price is not an item when it comes to our Mooney. I've got it covered. Pete, do you think you can remember the name of the store that your mum bought them from? Was it in Diagon Alley? Peter frowned, thinking hard. No, I think it was some sort of seasonal salesman. Maybe I could ask her? Sirius exchanged a glance with Peter. After a moment, he said carefully, As long as you think you can ask in a way that won't make her suspicious. Remember, we still need to make sure that no one in our families catches on to what we're doing. We can pretend that we're doing some sort of potions project together that we're working on, James suggested. A legal one, of course. I can come over to your house, Pete, and we can ask together. Yeah, maybe, Peter chewed his lip. Um... She's still a bit upset with your mum, though, you know, because of Christmas. He trailed off. James looked a bit surprised. Clearly, he hadn't considered that the Pettigrews could ever hesitate to allow him over, not after growing up, going in and out of each other's houses like they were a second home. Oh, right. Well, you can still use me as an excuse, anyway. Peter nodded, and Sirius turned back to his list. Well, assuming Pete can figure out the moth chrysalis... That just leaves the dew, from a place where neither human feet nor sunlight have ever touched. We won't need to worry about that part until it's actually time to start brewing the potion, but we all need to figure out where we can go to collect it from. James dumped another armful of books into his trunk and suggested, We can all go looking around for a spot that fits the description while we're at home. Sounds like we just need to find a shady area, and that shouldn't be too hard. Sirius frowned. Yeah... But we've got to make sure it's somewhere where no human feet have ever touched. So once we walk there, it won't work. Hmm, good point, James hummed thoughtfully. 
suppose we'll just have to look around as much as we can and make sure that we don't get too close to any spots that look promising. Yeah, Sirius mumbled, scanning the list again, I suppose. He frowned, reading back through the ingredients and feeling a twinge of anxiety as he wondered whether they'd actually be able to collect everything. After a moment, he felt the mattress dip as James sat down beside him. It'll be fine. We're going to pull it off, Black. Stop worrying. Sirius smiled gratefully, shoving the list back into his pocket. James always seemed to know exactly when he needed encouragement. Of course we'll pull it off, Sirius declared, standing with a dramatic flourish. We're marauders. Peter grinned from the floor, where he was searching for something under his bed. James smiled too, standing and reaching for an armful of records to pack. After a moment of silence, punctuated by only the sounds of items being moved in and out of trunks, Sirius leaned against the bedpost, twirling his wand in his fingers. So, he said slowly, boredom gnawing as he watched Peter refolding his clothes. What do you think you'll turn into? Hmm? Your animal. What kind of animagus do you think you'll be? His friends paused their packing. Peter appeared to be deep in thought, brow furrowed. He clearly hadn't given the matter much consideration. But James grinned, cocksure and confident, and puffed out his chest as he said, Well, it's obvious, isn't it? I'll be a lion. He looked so ridiculously proud of this declaration that Sirius couldn't help but laugh. You can't just choose the Gryffindor mascot, Potter. Says who? Besides, I've already got the hair, haven't I? He strutted in front of one of the Gryffindor banners and mussed up his hair, as if to prove a point. It was a compelling argument. James's hair was nearly as wild as the lion's flowing mane. All right, all right, Sirius laughed again, shaking his head. If anyone was going to be a lion, it would be James. He certainly had the pride for one, and the inherent sense of nobility and honour that seemed to go hand in hand with such a great beast. Sirius had no doubt that whatever James's animal ended up being, it would be as regal and as showy as the Gryffindor mascot. What about you, Pete? He turned to the smaller boy, who was chewing on his lip. I don't know, Peter moaned. I just hope it's not something awful. It might be nice to fly. Maybe a bird? Sirius sighed, exasperated. What kind of bird, though? There's more than one. Um, an owl? Now you're just choosing the first bird you thought of. Sirius rolled his eyes. There was no way that timid, insecure Peter would be anything as majestic as an owl. Maybe a sparrow, though. He was certainly skittish enough. Well, what do you think you'll be, if you've got it all figured out? Peter asked snippily, irritated. Sirius grinned. I, my dear marauding compatriots, am going to become, he paused dramatically for suspense, ignoring Peter's eye roll, a wolf. There was a beat of silence, and then both of his friends burst into laughter. I can't believe you were giving us grief when you've just gone and copied Remus, James said, trying to catch his breath. Sirius frowned, affronted. I'm not copying. Might I remind you that our esteemed Mr Lupin is not a wolf, but a werewolf. There is a difference. James rolled his eyes. Oh, please. Why do you think you'd be a wolf, then? Go on. He folded his arms, waiting. Sirius hesitated feeling suddenly embarrassed by the amount of thought he'd put into this decision. Unlike his friends, he'd actually spent quite a bit of time considering what animal he would be, and a wolf just felt right. They were pack animals, loyal and social, dangerous and cool, but with the same sort of canny exuberance that would lend itself just as easily to joy as to anger. Sirius had spent more time than he'd care to admit imagining how fun it would be to run through the forest with Remus, side by side, two wolves under the moon. But all of that felt too soppy to say, distinctly girlish. Instead, Sirius flipped his hair over his shoulder and smirked, drawling, Why? It all comes down to my natural magnetism, of course. James threw a pillow at him. Watch out, Black. With that sort of vanity, you might end up being a peacock. Chapter 56 Summer, 1974 The house had moved. It wasn't unheard of. The Black family manor was a feat of magic that had been passed down for hundreds of years. If the current owners found themselves needing to change location, abandoning such a valuable piece of family history was unthinkable. As such, the home had been magically transported all over Britain throughout the decades. 
Sirius knew this. His parents had quizzed them growing up on the previous manor's caretakers and the places they had resided, until he could recite the lineage that followed the house all the way back to 1773. But it had stayed in one place throughout his childhood, and nobody had thought to mention to him that his parents were even considering a change of location. So it was with quite a bit of shock that Sirius found himself side along apparating to a completely unfamiliar part of London. He blinked at the street of lavish townhouses, not understanding what had happened until he realised that the door in front of him was remarkably similar to that of the manor. We... we moved? He spun around, studying the street, taking in his surroundings. It was a residential area, clean and quiet, but still far busier than he was used to. There were muggles in the streets, bustling about. He had to fight to keep his jaw from hanging open. Had his parents willingly moved them to a house in the midst of muggle London? Well, Perga Black had already swept imperiously inside, leaving him to gawp. Regulus tutted as he followed their mother, sarcasm oozing from his voice as he drawled, Obviously. Sirius shot him a dirty look, hurrying inside. Well, where are we? Regulus shrugged. Islington, I think. You'd have known if you'd come home over Christmas. This last was said with a petulant jut of his lower lip an expression that bordered dangerously close to the territory of pouting. Sirius snorted. I wasn't invited home for Christmas, remember? You weren't required, Sirius. His mother's voice rang out sharply in the hall, making him jump. He refused to look away as she swept towards him, letting his chin jut out and hoping she couldn't sense the squirm of fear in his belly. Wapoga paused in front of her sons, eyes flicking over them. There is a difference. She lifted a hand towards Sirius's face, and he braced himself, trying not to flinch. But she only lifted a lock of his hair, rubbing gently between her fingertips before tucking it back behind his ear. A boy shouldn't need an invitation to come to see his family. Her voice was snakeskin quiet, smooth and dry. Sirius had expected one of the usual lectures about what a disappointment he was the moment he stepped through the door. But his mother only looked him over, once more, absently, and then ordered Creature to take care of their luggage before disappearing up the stairs in a swirl of black silk. Sirius blinked, at a loss for words. He'd been bracing himself for the worst since Regulus told him that he was expected home, but his mother hadn't seemed angry, just disappointed, resigned almost. Shame ran a sticky finger down his spine as he processed her words. Was he supposed to have come home without being required? Had that been some sort of test? But the note had made it seem like they didn't want him around, although he supposed that it hadn't actually forbid him from returning for the holidays. But what was he meant to think, when they'd been ignoring him for months? Regulus shifted awkwardly next to him. Sirius banished his line of thought with a quick sweep of anger. Who cared if his family had been setting some sort of test for him over Christmas break? It wouldn't have made a difference. He would have gone to the Potters either way. He turned back to Reg, asking cheerfully, Has she been like that since Christmas? Regulus shrugged, hovering next to him in the entryway. He was clearly torn between slouching off to continue their routine of ignoring each other, or, friend or spending a few more moments with the brother he had hardly spoken to all year. Sirius ran his fingers through his hair, untucking the strand that his mother had touched. Bloody creepy, he muttered, conspiratorially. I think I almost prefer it when she shouts. Apparently, this was the wrong thing to say, because something shuttered behind Reggie's face, and he frowned, mumbling. She's got a lot going on. Sirius rolled his eyes. Yeah, yeah, Mum and Dad have always got a lot going on, haven't they? It came off a bit sharper than he meant it to, and Regulus turned away. Whatever, Sirius, he muttered, moving towards the stairs. There's a lot happening that you don't know about. Sirius didn't have a chance to question Reg about what he meant, as he disappeared almost immediately into the dark stretch of the hallway atop of the stairs. But it didn't take long for him to realise that his brother was telling the truth. It started with the whispering. Sirius would walk past a room and hear his parents in hushed voices, murmuring words too quiet for him to make out. Sometimes he would accidentally stumble on one of these whispering conversations, and his parents would immediately fall silent, waiting until he left the room to resume talking. It was incredibly disconcerting. While the blacks could certainly be secretive, 
Orion and Walpurga had always lived with a sort of haughty outspokenness within the walls of their manor. If they had something to say, they said it clearly, convinced of its truth. Cyrus's parents had never felt the need to whisper around him, like children keeping a secret. It made him feel alienated, a spy in his own home. And then there were the meetings. They seemed to be held in all hours of the day. Orion and Walpurga were in and out of the house at odd hours, leaving, the, leaving in the middle of the night and returning just before dawn. Other times the gatherings were hosted at grim old place, and Sirius's parents would usher their guests into their office, where they would shut the doors and cast silencing charms. Regulus was often invited. Sirius was not. Part of him wanted to interrogate Reg about it, to demand someone tell him the truth. But his pride wouldn't allow it. He couldn't exactly go whining about being left out of the black family business when he had spent the past three years insisting that he wanted nothing to do with any of them. And there was another, smaller part of him, which dug claws into the back of his mind, that he didn't want to know at all. Part of him was afraid that he already knew. Part of him that cringed, that tied his stomach into knots as he read the Daily Prophet articles about increasing political tensions and wizarding attacks on muggles. He tried to tell himself that surely, surely his family couldn't be involved in that. Surely there were lines they wouldn't cross. The blacks had a long history of dark magic, sure, but in recent decades most of their activity had been li- but in recent decades most of their activity had been limited to the internal wizarding politics. They wrote basic laws and pushed for discriminatory policies, but they didn't they wouldn't he tried not to think about it. Writing letters to his friends helped. None of them had much going on. Remus was vague, as usual, about his summer activities, and James and Peter seemed to be spending most of their time lazing about in the sun or flying their brooms. They didn't discuss their enemy guys plans in their letters. Too much to risk too much risk of interception, especially with creature lurking about. But Sirius managed to sneak some of his family's silver teaspoons into his trunk. His parents were practically treating him like he was invisible again, so it wasn't all that hard to do. After a few weeks of wandering about his own home like a stranger, Sirius, in a burst of boredom-induced courage, requested to spend the summer at the Potters. He expected a scathing rejection, perhaps paired with a harsh lecture, maybe some more physical discipline, or, at the very least, chores with Creature as punishment for his insolence. His parents had brought him home for the summer, after all, which meant they must have a reason for wanting him around. Sirius was so sure that they would say no to his request that he came as a complete shock when his father, seated at the large mahogany desk, didn't even glance up from the paperwork as he was sorting through as he sighed and said, If you must. Sirius blinked. Really? Really? Orion Black glanced up, grey eyes flashing dangerously. Do not make me repeat myself, boy. He nodded, throat dry, and backed out of the office before his father could change his mind. Sirius couldn't wrap his head around it. Hadn't his parents... Hadn't his parents nearly been out of their minds with anger last year, foaming at the mouth any time someone mentioned Sirius's friendship with James? Hadn't his blood traitor activities been the whole reason behind that stupid engagement? He frowned as he packed his trunk, questions pounding like a headache behind his eyes. Had they already disinherited him? Had it... and just forgotten to let him know? But if that was the case, why force him to come home for the summer? If they truly didn't care, why not just pack him off to the potters the second term ended? Sirius decided to stick to his trusty method of not thinking about it, trying to cheer up as he penned a letter to James. The response came within hours. The potters would love to have Sirius spend the summer. Euphemia had already made up a bed. He left that evening with barely a glance from either of his parents on the way out. Although as he turned to look back from the front door, Regulus was there half-shadowed and half-hovering at the top of the stairs, looking very young, alone in the wide, dark hallway. Sirius paused. People always told him that he and Reg looked alike. He understood why, the dark hair, the sharp nose, the icy eyes. With the tangled branches of the black family tree, it was almost impossible not to find his features on someone else's face. He shared brows, hands, cheekbones with various cousins, aunts and uncles. 
Of course, being brothers, Sirius would expect to look even more similar to Reg. So it was strange, the sudden feeling that he was staring at a complete stranger. Or, not a stranger, exactly, something closer, more warped. When he was very little, his Uncle Alfred had taken him to a muggle carnival, once, where they stared at their reflections in the trick mirrors that distorted their figures to something barely recognisable. They had laughed and pointed, and Sirius had clapped his chubby little hands. After, his mother had gone incandescent with rage, screaming until he cried, and Sirius had never got to spend time with Uncle Alfie ever again. Looking up at Regulus was a bit like that, like seeing something he was supposed to recognise, and knowing what it was, but at the same time seeing the wrongness of it, and cataloguing all of the places where the features didn't quite match up. Sirius tried to smile, but it felt misplaced. He was about to attempt some sort of goodbye, but Regulus just shook his head and turned. The shadows embraced him with open, hungry mouths, and the moment was gone. Things were much better at the Potters. They always were. James was thrilled to have him there, and Mr. and Mrs. Potter welcomed him so warmly that Sirius was nearly overcome with a wash of gratitude, which left tears pricking at his eyes. They set him up in his usual bedroom, his usual bedroom, and fed him cucumber sandwiches and freshly squeezed lemonade. There was no one on earth who could dote quite as well as Euphemia Potter, and Sirius lapped up the attention greedily. He and James spent their days soaring on broomsticks, or exploring the woods near the house, or listening to Mr. Potter's stories about the years he spent travelling before, as he told it, a particularly tentatious and strikingly beautiful young woman, convinced me to settle down. Peter came over almost every day, cajoling them into games of chess that he won handily every time, and filling in his keeper for their Quidditch practice. They were able to discuss their Animagus plans in person, working to gather ingredients and practicing the enunciation for the incantation. At night, Sirius snuck into James's room, and they whispered about plans for next year's pranks as they fell asleep. Of course, not everything was perfect. The Daily Prophet continued to report an uprising in dark magic and scattered attacks, delivering news of wartime politics that hung like a dark cloud over what should have otherwise been a happy, carefree summer. While there weren't secret meetings, while there weren't secret meetings and whispered conversations to the same level there had been in Grimmauld Place, Mr. and Mrs. Potter were clearly involved in the politics of the war as well. They had their own private, murmuring conversations, and even and every once in a while they would meet in a group of old friends who would retire to the study and shut the door behind them. Sirius tried not to let it bother him, but it was growing harder and harder to ignore the war, which crawled like a body from a grave slow and creeping, breathing promises of death into the air around them. He may have been young, but Sirius knew enough about war to know that there was always two sides, and to know the Blacks and the Potters would not be fighting for the same cause, even if he still didn't entirely understand what those causes were. The war wasn't the only problem. Sirius was also pretty sure that there was something going on with Remus. His letters grew more and more terse, as though he was angry with them, and eventually he stopped responding at all. No matter how the others tried to reach out, their owls returned with empty talons every time. Eventually, they all stopped writing to him, but Sirius didn't stop worrying, especially after the time he glanced at the newspaper and saw headlines about muggles being attacked. He hoped that Mooney was safe, wherever he was, and the night of the July full moon, Sirius found himself staring up at the sky through the window as he drifted off to sleep. In his dream, something was howling, and it sounded like music. Chapter 57 Fourth Year, A Gathering Storm Sunday, the 1st of September, 1974 Sirius didn't see his brother at the train station, or his mother, or his father. He wondered if they'd arrived early, or if perhaps they were running late. It wasn't that he was looking for them because he wanted to see them. It was quite the opposite. He kept glancing around platform nine and three quarters to make sure he wouldn't run into them, so that he could go on ignoring them and they could go on pretending he didn't exist. Better for everyone, that way. There was a flash of dark hair in the corner of his eye and he spun around, but it wasn't Reg, just some witch with dark curls that flounced over her shoulders as she rushed to give her friend a hug. Sirius turned back to the Potters, who were trying to engage the Pettigrews in stilted, awkward conversation. According to Peter, 
Even though his parents had allowed him over during the summer to visit James, they were still upset with Mr. and Mrs. Potter for encouraging Philomena to act out. She'd moved to America, and Mrs. Pettigrew was sure that the decision had been spurted by something one of the Potters had said to her, or done. James caught his eye as he turned back, raising a brow. You're right, mate. You seem a bit... tense. He murmured the words, voice low enough that only Sirius could hear. Besides them, Mrs. Potter was asking with forced cheer about Mrs. Pettigrew's crop of squash that summer. Sirius shrugged and plastered on a smile. I'm fine. James studied him for a moment before turning back to his family. They hugged the Potters goodbye shortly after. Euphemia squeezed Sirius so hard that he thought his ribs might crack. He loved it. Fleamont patted him on the back and slipped a chocolate frog into his pocket, winking. Mrs. Pettigrew fussed over Peter and sent a final resentful glance towards the Potters before sending her son off, and the three climbed on board the Hogwarts Express to head to their usual compartment. Petey, Sirius cooed, a sticky sweet impression of Mrs. Pettigrew's high, nervous voice. Have you got enough snacks? Oh, Petey, did Mummy remember to pack your wand? Petey, do you need... Peter groaned loudly, flopping down on his seat. Don't start, he moaned. She's always like that, and it's only gotten worse now that Philly's run off. James patted his friend on the back, comfortingly. Don't worry, mate. I get why your mum's worried, but I'm sure Philly's all right. Yeah, Peter said glumly, scuffing his shoes against the ground. I just wish she'd at least given us some kind of heads up. Now Mum keeps acting like I'm going to run off and live amongst muggles. If she doesn't remind me every five seconds how much she's counting on me to, I don't know, uphold the family legacy or something. She keeps talking about trying to get me into an internship at the Ministry. Sirius scoffed. The Ministry? Never figured you'd be much of a politician, Pete. Doubt I'd have anything to do with politics. Doubt I'd have anything to do with politics. With my luck, whatever she'll find, it'll be really boring, filling out paperwork in the Department of Magical Transportation or something. I don't know, James said, growing sombre. Seems like there's politics everywhere in the Ministry these days. Did you lot see the Prophet this morning? He dug around for his copy of the newspaper, pulling it out and unfolding it. Sirius squeezed on the bench next to Peter to read over his shoulder and the three of them examined the headline together. Jenkins criticised as security measures on ministry are tightened. They were still reading when the door to their compartment swung open, and Remus marched in. All right, he said gruffly as he entered, voice a bit deeper in his chest. James lowered the paper, and they all turned to greet him, and Sirius's throat went dry. He was taller. That was the first thing that Sirius noticed. At the beginning of the summer... He had only had an inch or two on James, but now Remus seemed to tower over them, filling the doorway with his long legs. His face had changed, too. Any lingering softness was gone, leaving a squared-off jaw and a protruding Adam's apple that bobbed when he swallowed. His skin was dotted with freckles, and a few shades darker, signs of long hours spent out in the sun. There was a rosy flush on his cheekbones that appeared to be the final remains of a sunburn, and his clothes a smart button-down that made him look older, somehow, bright blue drainpipe jeans, and chunky black boots that Sirius immediately fell in love with. It was the coolest thing he'd ever seen. His palms felt sweaty. It wasn't just the outfit and the growth spurt, though. There was something else, different about him, about the way he carried himself. He stood with his legs apart, hands shoved in his pockets, jaw set hard. There was something alive in his eyes, something jumping and dangerous, like sparks from a fire. Often, it was difficult for Sirius to imagine his quiet, bookish friend transforming into a wild beast every full moon, but now, hypnotised by the mean glint in Lupin's eye, it felt as though the wolf was crawling just under the surface of his friend's skin. James and Peter were clearly surprised too. Sirius could practically feel Peter's anxiety and James's concern, rolling like waves over their skin. Part of him registered the fact that, clearly, something bad had happened to Remus, but he couldn't muster up the nervous energy that his other two friends were exuding. His brain felt all fuzzy, for some reason. Remus slung himself into the empty seat across from them, 
acting as though he couldn't sense their friend's shock. Good summer. James attempted a smile. Not bad, he answered slowly. The usual. You know. How was yours? Yeah, good. Rima shifted to reach into his back pocket, pulling out a small tin box. Sirius watched, riveted, as he opened to reveal five pre-rolled cigarettes. He plucked one and lifted it to his lips, shutting the case with a snap. His hands had grown with the rest of him, fingers scarred and tendons shifting as he lifted some sort of little stick which, when struck, began to miraculously burn. It was hypnotising, watching the fire catch onto the paper of the cigarette, turning it crumpily and red as Remus inhaled. The smell was awful, bitter, like a handful of ash, but Sirius could hardly bring himself to care. Remus's lips parted as he exhaled, and the smoke spilled from his mouth to dance teasingly in the air before dissipating. It was like magic. James was still speaking, voice concerned as he said, We were worried when we didn't hear from you. Remus shrugged. Sorry, busy. Another breath. The smoke, the smoke sighed from his lips. Doing what? Sirius asked, curiosity making him dizzy. Or maybe that was just the smoke. James opened a window to let it out. Just busy, Remus replied, face infuriatingly blank. Sirius could have been annoyed with him. He always got annoyed when Remus was cagey like this. But for some reason, irritation couldn't penetrate today. Remus was smoking a cigarette, wearing steel toe boots, looking like the definition of mysterious, had come to life and walked out of the pages of a dictionary. Well, it wouldn't have been quite right if he had immediately started spilling his guts. Of course, Sirius was going to get to the bottom of whatever this was. Are you okay, Remus? James asked, after a tense pause. Has something happened? Nope. You seem different. Your clothes! Peter squeaked, suddenly. I've seen muggles dressed like it, Sirius said quickly. It's cool, right, Remus? Lupin shrugged, nonchalant. My mate's got for me, that's all. Oh, well, if it's a muggle thing, James hedged, still looking uncomfortable. You sure you're okay? Oh, lay off, Potter. Remus sighed tilting his head back onto the seat and rolling his eyes as he took another drag from his cigarette. He swallowed, looking bored with the attention. Sirius watched the movement in his throat. "'What are you reading, then?' he asked, nodding at the forgotten newspaper spread across their laps. James looked down, a grave expression on his face. "'The war,' he said, passing the paper over to Remus. "'War?' The nonchalance slipped as Mooney sat up straight, clearly shocked. What war? He snatched the paper and scanned the headline, eyes going wide. Didn't you know? James asked, baffled. The Wizarding World has been officially at war since 1970. Sirius and Peter nodded. For the past four years, the war had been a sort of dark black drop against the Wizarding World, something adults discussed in hushed voices. But that didn't really concern children. It had always been a nebulous concept, something tied up with the Ministry, and politics, and complicated laws that really didn't affect the boys' lives, at least not yet. With the way things were going this summer, though, it had begun to feel more real. We weren't even at Hogwarts in 1970, Remus responded defensive. I hardly knew anything about wizards then. What? I mean, who were we fighting? Well, that's the problem, James frowned. It's too difficult to know. But this Dark Lord person seems to be gathering a lot of allies. Almost all purebloods. I reckon those are the meetings my family is going to, Sirius muttered darkly. James's dad agrees with me. He wasn't entirely sure why he'd talked to Mr. Potter about it, only that he kept thinking about it over the summer, wondering if Mr. and Mrs. Potter looked at him and saw his family, if they thought about whether they could trust him, whether he'd run back and report everything he heard to his parents. He'd felt the need to distance himself, somehow, to say, I'm on your side. So he'd told Monty about the strange meetings and the hushed conversations, and the grey-haired man had nodded, thoughtfully, looking troubled. Is that why the Slytherins were such a pleasure to be around last year? Remus asked, realisation creeping over his face. Yep, Sirius replied. And it'll be worse this year, you can bet. There were some attacks. 
over the summer, James said nervously, on muggles and a few mixed blood families. They think the Dark Lord is using dangerous creatures, Peter piped up, voice wobbly and anxious. Vampires and giants and... and... Remus's eyes had gone flat. He glared at Peter, clenching his jaw. And werewolves? Mooney, James started to speak, but Remus stood before he could finish. I need the loo, he said gruffly, yanking open the door, and then he was gone. There was a beat of silence, and then... Nice going, idiot. Cyrus punched Peter on the arm, scowling. I'm sorry, the smaller boy yelped, scooting closer to James and rubbing his arm resentfully. I didn't think, um... Sirius rolled his eyes. Well, you can say that again. He'll probably be off sulking for the rest of the train ride now, thanks to you. All right, all right, James lifted a hand. Pete says he's sorry. There's no use arguing about it. Sirius huffed, turning to stare out the window, and James sighed. He plucked the newspaper off Remus's seat, folding it and tucking it away as he asked. Do you reckon he's okay? Who? Mooney? Yeah. He said he was fine, didn't he? Yeah, but you know how he gets. Sirius sighed. He did know. They all did. Peter nodded, silently agreeing with James. Just give him a few minutes, Sirius suggested, glancing at the empty seat. If he doesn't come back, then I'll go find him. The air still smelled like smoke. Ten minutes passed, during which James engaged Peter in a mind-numbingly boring conversation about chess club. Sirius tapped his foot, impatient, and after another five minutes had gone by, he stood up and made his way into the train to look for Remus. James asked if he and Peter should go too, but Sirius convinced them to stay, knowing enough about Mooney to know that he wouldn't want to cause any sort of sense, knowing enough about Mooney to know that he wouldn't want to cause any sort of scene. Remus was not in the loo, which wasn't entirely surprising. Sirius had expected that that was just an excuse to go off and brood by himself. Sure enough, after poking his head in and out of a few different cabins, he managed to find Lupin in an empty one, staring out of the window, alone and smoking another cigarette. Mooney? He poked his head in the door, hit once again with the ash-burnt smell of smoke. Remus glared at him. He came in anyway. All right, what's up? Sirius settled himself on the opposite seat, getting comfortable. Nothing. Remus crossed his arms, sulking and slouching, staring at his boots. The cigarette burnt in his fingertips. Something's up. You're not yourself. Now would you know? Remus snapped aggressively. Maybe this is who I really am. Sirius felt a strange burst of affection for his friend who could be so ridiculously melodramatic without even realising it. I just know, he held Lupin's gaze. It's okay to be angry sometimes, Remus. It doesn't mean anything, except that you're normal. The glare faltered, softened by surprise, and Sirius smiled. He wasn't always good with feelings, but anger was something he understood, better than James and Peter at least. Knowing that he was probably only allowed one moment of authenticity before running the risk of appearing too girly, Sirius let his smile sharpen into a smirk. And for what it's worth, I really do think you look so bloody cool. Really? Yeah, kind of dangerous. Remus snorted, saying dryly, Thanks. So, bad summer, was it? Remus shrugged. It was okay. I was... I did a lot of stuff. I don't want James to know about it. Sirius struggled with the curiosity clawing in his chest, desperate to know exactly what a lot of stuff entailed, but he could tell Remus didn't want an interrogation. So he only cocked his head and said, Okay, can I try a cigarette? Remus's lips quirked up, as if Sirius had said something amusing, and then he smiled and fished out the little tin box. He tossed it to Sirius, along with the box of little sticks, which created a moment of panic as Sirius tried to remember what exactly Remus had done with them to start a fire. It wasn't too difficult to figure out, though. He struck one of the sticks against the box, igniting it, and pursed his lips around the little paper cylinder. He cupped his hands as he lit it, hoping that he was doing everything correctly, and hoping that he looked as cool as Remus had when he did it. Sirius sucked shallowly, trying desperately not to cough. The cigarette tasted like it smelled, Bitter, ashy, slightly gritty. 
It was a strange sensation, breathing in smoke. His lungs rebelled, chest itchy and tight, but he held on to it as they relaxed. He couldn't look like a wimp in front of Remus. Still, he couldn't prevent a grimace from crawling across his face as Lupin smirked. You get used to it. Okay. Sirius raised the cigarette back into his mouth, breathing more deeply this time, testing his limits. Remus relaxed back into his seat, watching him through the bullish haze, and Sirius never felt so aware of his eyes. He really, really hoped he looked cool. I found out some things at the end of last term, Remus said softly, after a few minutes of lazy silence. Before Sirius could respond, he was reaching into his shirt pocket, pulling out what appeared to be a few crumpled newspaper clippings. Sirius leaned forward, fingertips brushing the smoke, as he accepted the paper from Remus's hands. I don't want to talk about it yet, Remus said, sitting back. But read him if you like. Okay, Sirius said quietly, holding the clippings carefully, gently. Thank you, Remus.